All right, so today I'd like to talk to you about the uh, cognitive and psychiatric aspects of Parkinson's disease. So I saw this great slide at a meeting I was recently at, so I, I brought it to you today. Uh, first, I want to tell you that I don't really have any relevant financial relationships uh, with uh, about the topics I'm going to talk about today. Um, hopefully today we'll become familiar with the behavioral disturbances that you'll see commonly in Parkinson's disease. These include things like anxiety, apathy, depression, impulse control disorders, and some mild cognitive impairment. And I'm really going to focus on one type of cognitive impairment. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the biological aspects of Parkinson's and its treatments may be associated with these problems, and then uh, review some specific examples, because I, you know, for me, what really anchors things in my mind is if you tell me a little story that actually happened to somebody. So I actually think Parkinson's disease is a great model for neuropsychiatric symptoms, meaning that the underlying biology of the disease might overlap with some of the same circuitry that causes the symptoms I'm going to talk about. So this is a slide I mentioned. When I saw this, I thought this was a great way to think about Parkinson's disease. I've gone to conferences that sometimes are a week long about Parkinson's disease, and we'll spend you know, six of the seven days talking about that top part, about the slowed movement, the rigidity, and the tremor. And then look at all those other symptoms. We call them non-motor symptoms. Anxiety, apathy, agitation, hallucinations, the gastroparesis you just heard about that might start decades before you actually see these movement symptoms, pain, low blood pressure, sleep disturbances. All of this is going on at the same time that you're experiencing these motor symptoms, and we have increasingly become aware that these symptoms are probably present in the majority of people before the motor symptoms are even recognized. So what causes behavioral and psychiatric problems in Parkinson's? Well, in psychiatry, we think of things in what we call the biopsychosocial model, and so there's certainly almost always going to be some contribution to how you experience a disease or any type of stress in your life. So in this case, it's a reaction to the diagnosis, all right? So you're cruising along in life, and at some point, you're diagnosed with this neurological disorder, and it sort of changes the way you think about retirement and the rest of your life. And as the disability sets in, it may even start to change your interpersonal roles. Uh, and so we think that has a very important impact on people's psychological health. We're almost certain that it's related to some degree to the same changes that cause the movement abnormalities. So your body is losing dopamine. Dopamine's a very important chemical for movement, but it's also very important for mood regulation and the ability to experience pleasure from the things you normally enjoy in your day-to-day -day life. It's the hedonic chemical in the brain. Now, another way that the disease and its treatments might impact your mood and mental health are we're flooding your brain with dopamine. Okay, we're not able to target it to the movement centers, right? You take it orally, most of you, some maybe through the gut, but you take it orally and it goes, once it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it crosses over and floods the entire brain, meaning that it has its intended effects in the areas we want it to go to, but it also goes to many other areas and can cause some trouble. And that's largely what I'm going to talk about today is when mental health is affected. But I want to show you this graph. If you look at the horizontal line there on the bottom, Time zero is when your motor symptoms, the slowness, the tremor, the rigidity are recognized. That's time zero. Everything to the left of zero is before you're even diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and everything to the right is after you're diagnosed and dopamine medications are being introduced. Okay, so we're flooding your brain. And what do you see there? You see a peak in psychological problems 
right around time zero. And so what's going on? You're realizing that you have a chronic disease. You've just been diagnosed, so you have that psychosocial reaction. The biology is present. It may have been present for decades. And oh, by the way, we're giving you dopamine medications. So this is uh, basically a systematic review of multiple studies all pushed together, represents thousands of patients. So our confidence that this occurs in the majority of people with Parkinson's is pretty high. So now I want to talk about the psychological symptoms you may see in detail. So the first, and this is just alphabetical, is anxiety. So how common is anxiety in Parkinson's disease? Well, at least half of people during the course of the illness will experience clinically significant symptoms, okay? A feeling of restlessness or maybe even some panic from time to time. And about a third of people will have a diagnosable syndrome or condition, like a generalized anxiety disorder or full spectrum panic disorder that requires treatment or leads to disabling anxiety. Now, what's interesting about this is that when we looked at anxiety in Parkinson's compared to just the general population, we noticed uh, some unusual characteristics. And again, here's another version of that same graph where time zero represents the start of the movement symptoms. Everything to the left is an anxiety disorder that was diagnosed or occurred before you were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And everything around and after the zero is anxiety that first occurred after diagnosis with Parkinson's. And when we looked at that red peak, what we found is that about two-thirds of that was related to on-off fluctuations in dopaminergic medication, meaning that people would take their dopamine, get relief from their movement symptoms, but as they, as that levodopa effect started to wear off, not only did their movement symptoms come back, they became profoundly anxious and dysphoric. And we thought, well, then that looks like there's maybe some dopaminergic contribution to anxiety and Parkinson's. And so, uh, you know, so we call this the on and the off. You guys are all familiar with that, and I know you just heard about this in some of the other lectures. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, ideally, your neurologist is putting the medications together close enough to where you don't experience the low off periods too often, but inevitably you'll have some of this. And even if the motor symptoms are well controlled, in that lower dopamine state sometimes people do still experience anxiety. And we know this again with pretty good confidence because way back in the mid-90s, uh, Jay Nutt's group out in the uh, Oregon Health System did a study where they actually did an intravenous infusion of levodopa into patients with Parkinson's disease. And what they found is as they infused dopamine and had people tap their fingers, well, of course, their tapping got faster as the dopamine went in, but their mood also improved. When they turned off the infusion, their finger tapping slowed down, and their mood got worse. And so clearly that established the association. And they did a similar thing with anxiety, and they found that as they stopped the dopamine infusion, people got much more anxious. When they restarted it, people's anxiety dropped. And so again, right now, although we have this knowledge that dopamine is linked to anxiety and Parkinson's disease, there have been no formal controlled trials to treat anxiety and Parkinson's with medications. There are uh, two studies that are just completing enrollment. One is my own, which used the rotigotine patch to sort of normalize that up and down of the dopamine dosing to see if it improved anxiety. The other is one by Irene Richard at the University of Rochester. She used a medication called Boostpar, which is more of a serotonergic agent uh, to do this. And hopefully the results will be out later this year. Uh, right now, um, I don't know that either one of these will be the complete answer. So more trials are necessary. So you might ask, well, what do I do if I have anxiety and Parkinson's now? 
while we're waiting for results and new trials to go forward. Well, one thing that's almost certainly helpful is what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is a type of talk therapy that's administered in a very rigorous way. In fact, you'll go home from your appointments with homework, okay? And so usually this requires a, a CBT certified therapist. Um, they're available in most health systems. And so I would definitely recommend you pursue that. The other thing that is often tried, although the evidence is lacking, specifically in Parkinson's, is many people use the same medications for anxiety that they use in any other condition. So these are things like antidepressants that also work for anxiety, and something called benzodiazepines, which are your clonazepams, lorazepams, uh, although you have to be a little more cautious if you use these in Parkinson's, because although they'll work for almost any type of anxiety, they can increase the risk of falls and confusion, so you have to be really careful when you use them, but they are effective. Now, depression, depression is a, another highly common mental health problem in Parkinson's disease. And just to give you an idea of its impact, right now the, the largest ongoing study of people with Parkinson's disease is run by the Parkinson's Foundation. It's called the Parkinson's Outcome Project. Some of you may actually already be involved with this because a lot of it's done online. It's already got over 12,000 people with Parkinson's and information for several year, years on these people. And what they found is depression has more than twice the adverse impact on your quality of life than the motor symptoms, the tip of the iceberg thing I just showed you, the thing that you're getting the dopamine for. Depression is more impactful. So then the question is, wow, why aren't we diagnosing it more aggressively and treating it? Uh, maybe as many as half of people with Parkinson's will have depression. And I don't mean just being a little sad for a few hours a couple of times. I mean being really down to the point where it disrupts your ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. About half of people with Parkinson's will experience this at some point during the disease. We don't know how long episodes last. We don't know once an episode remits whether it'll come back or not. Uh, we do know that if you have mild depressive symptoms and you don't treat them, it greatly increases the risk of getting severe depressive symptoms. So if you're feeling depressed, you want to let your doctor know so that if it requires attention, they can treat it before it becomes disabling. The other thing we know, and this is sort of interesting, is that in people who didn't know they had Parkinson's, so had unrecognized Parkinson's, and were being treated with an antidepressant, specifically the tricyclic antidepressants, and then let's say they, a couple months later, walked into the neurologist's office and were diagnosed with Parkinson's, having been on an antidepressant delayed their need to symptomatic dopamine therapy by up to a year. And so clearly, there's some association between the depression and how the Parkinson's symptoms affect the person. And I'm going to show you that in a couple of different ways. So this is a, a study from our Udall Center here. Uh, it's, uh, we used, I think, the first six years of study data from the Udall Center here. And what we looked at, let me orient you to this graph, because this is pretty interesting. I'll use this fancy pointer here. On this side here, this NWDS, Northwestern Disability Scale, okay? And the higher the number, the more functional you are, and the lower the number, the more disabled you are. So these people are highly functioning and these people are lower functioning. Now the Northwestern Disability Scale looks at things like walking, dressing, feeding yourself, really simple physical things, brushing your teeth, okay? physical things. Now, this line down here, this horizontal line, this is the visit you're at, and there's two years between each visit. So actually, this goes out to about eight um, years of the study. And then this line here is the people, the green line that goes across here, are people that were never depressed. So during their time in this eight-year period, they never had depression. And you can see, more or less, 
that they functioned at a high level across those eight years. There's a little bit of a decrement. Some of that's the Parkinson's, because remember, it's a progressive disease. Some of that's normal aging. Then you see these, this dashed blue line. That's people who might have been depressed at some point, and the depression either spontaneously remitted or was treated into remission. And then probably most importantly, this dashed red line are people who are actively depressed or symptomatically depressed. And you can see that at any time period across these eight years, anyone who's depressed is functioning physically at a lower level than the people who are actively depressed, okay? So I'm telling you that a mental symptom, depression, is directly impacting your ability to brush your teeth, walk, feed yourself, all of this, okay? And so the message here is that if you treat depression, not only are you alleviating the suffering from the low mood, you're restoring yourself to a higher level of physical functioning, okay? And this was mentioned at the plenary of the Movement Disorder Society, I think three, four years ago now. So we think this is a really important message. You know, if you're depressed, it's not enough just to take your dopamine medications. You need to treat this depression. So what do you treat it with? This is a messy slide, but this is a, just came out literally this year. This is the evidence-based uh, literature for treating depression and Parkinson's. So the, I, what I would take from this is that there's good evidence that many things may help. And I'm just gonna point to a few that have the best evidence here. So there is a generically available, low-cost antidepressant called venlafaxine that's the generic name. Effexor is the brand name. It's down there toward the bottom of the slide. That is right now the best evidence treatment for depression and Parkinson's disease, or one of the best evidence. Now, all the other ones that say possibly useful, the only reason they say possibly is just that they haven't been studied specifically yet, okay? Or, or the studies are too small to draw firm conclusions. They most likely are. They just haven't been studied as rigorously. Now, you might say, well, with all those options, how do I choose between them? The first is, which ones do you tolerate? You know, if I give them to you and you get a stomach ache, you have some sort of side effect, obviously that's not the one for you. But some of them have special properties. So for instance, the venlafaxine, if you have some pain, especially a chronic type of pain along with your depression, venlafaxine's a great option because in the United States, it's probably used equally as often for depression as it is for chronic pain. So if I have someone who has some neuropathy or other problems or a stiff shoulder due to their Parkinson's, I'm gonna reach for the venlafaxine if they also have depression. But many things are available. Not all of them are medications. Down near the bottom of the list, you can see, again, that CBT, that cognitive behavioral therapy. So it works for anxiety and it works for depression as well, and oftentimes you can get both symptoms to respond from the same therapeutic session. So it's uh, oftentimes very worthwhile. Now apathy, apathy, uh, I think it's best I tell you a story about apathy because it's a, a little tricky otherwise, because the first question people ask about apathy is, well, how, how is it different than depression? Because depressed people don't care about anything and don't want to do anything. They're very energic, right? Well, this Venn diagram, I think, really captures it. So you can see that the apathetic person, this is auto advancing. This is great. This is like Toyota when they had the brake problem, right? It's going forward even when you don't want to. So the the apathy doesn't have a lot of the negative thoughts and feelings, okay? So people aren't motivated, they don't necessarily enjoy things, they don't initiate activities, but they're not necessarily upset about it. So let me tell you something, if you're a physician, you're not gonna see the apathetic patient walk into your office and ask for treatment <laughs> because they don't care. You know, they're perfectly fine. The person that's going to come into your office is the caregiver or spouse. They're going to come in and say, he doesn't do anything. He just sits on the couch all day. And this is the story I want to tell you. So, you know, a couple of months ago, a woman brings 
her husband in and says, you know, he just sits on the couch every day and he doesn't do anything, you know. I, and I'm thinking, yeah, he's watching football or baseball. That's doing something, but she just doesn't appreciate it, right? No, she, she says, well, look, the, the power went out, and when the power went out, the cable went out. And then the power came back on, but the cable didn't, so there's just snow on the TV. And, you know, I thought, this guy's so lazy. Let's see how long it takes him to lean over and get the remote control, you know, to get it off the snow. And she says... I just kept letting it go, letting it go. I looked over the clock three hours later. He's watching the snow as enthusiastically as he was watching the baseball game. And she said, and then I knew something was wrong because he didn't care, snow, seventh inning, walk off homer, didn't matter. This guy didn't care. And to me, that really captures apathy, right? He's, he's not upset, but he's also not engaged. And so apathy is, is a, a profoundly disturbing symptom, but usually for people around the patient rather than the patient. Now, how do you manage apathy? Well, there are some medications, uh, dopamine agonists and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh, have some evidence that they might be helpful, but probably the best thing, I mean, even beyond those medications that you can do is schedule activities. Make sure that there's a palette of things for the person to do because, you know, once you get them off the couch, they'll engage and do things, and that seems to get, get them in motion and uh, make sure that they have clear and achievable goals. Um, and then give rewards, but conditional on completion of whatever activity you want them to get into. And really, just like there's freezing and start hesitation with the motor symptoms, apathy may be part of that same circuitry where people just don't initiate their own activities. So if you provide the spark and the structure, oftentimes people do well. It's not like the depressed guy who gets out there and is just like, I don't want to be here and is really irritable. The apathetic person will just go, you know, but you've got you've to make them get off the couch and provide something to engage them. So impulse control disorders. This is another, another neat topic. I won't give you too many examples here, though. Uh, so what, what are impulse control disorders? Well, they're, they're really a, a mix of different behaviors that are performed repetitively, excessively, and with a lack of self-control to an extent that it interferes with life functioning. So let me, let me just be really clear here. None of these impulse control disorders are necessarily odd behaviors. They're things we all do, okay? It's just we don't normally do them out in the middle of the living room with a crowd. Or we don't normally do three boxes of Cheetos. You know, we might stop at half a bag and then realize what we're doing, right? These things are beyond the normal extent to which behaviors are performed. And there's a clear association with these dopamine agonist medications, okay? Uh, your Pramoprexols, your Requips, um, they're clearly associated there. And people, uh, these are the most commonly reported, but I want to tell you these aren't the only things we've heard. Pathological gambling, uh, and I mean sometimes big league, like spending, you know, the retirement savings, spending the kids' college fund. Uh, Compulsive buying or shopping, so, I don't know, 15 Art Deco lamps for a two-bedroom condo. Uh, hypersexual behaviors, I uh, have to borrow language from our former boss, Zoltan Mari. He always used to call it extra physiologic. I mean, when you got 75-year-old guys doing something 18-year-olds can't do, it's probably some jet fuel in there, right? And it's the dopamine, okay? There's something that's activating people in a way we've never seen. And then binge eating. And I don't mean comfort eating or that, you know, cheesecake I had last night at midnight. I mean, can't stop, just don't know why you're doing it, feeling compelled to eat type of eating, okay? Now, another type of behavior that goes along with this and might be different in terms of the mechanism, but we hear about these things oftentimes in clusters. In fact, if I see, if I see this, dopamine dysregulation syndrome, you can almost bet that there's going to be impulse control disorders. And dopamine dysregulation is when people start taking their Parkinson's medications like heroin or like cocaine. They're, they're getting some sort of 
euphoria from it sometimes, okay? They, uh, they're taking more than the indicated amount. Oftentimes we can see this because they're wildly dyskinetic or we see a lot of those impulse control behaviors. We think it might be a little more common in people who are younger or have earlier onset Parkinson's, and most of the cases I've seen have been males, although here's another story I have to tell you. We, we had one woman. Do I have time for a story? I do have time for a story. So we had one woman. This is a true story. We had um, tried to stop her as an outpatient, tried to stop her as an outpatient, and they said she's just, you know, her prescriptions are coming due in the middle of the month, so she's clearly using it at double speed, right, using up her cinnamon. And well, let's admit her to the hospital, right? And then that way we can sort of, we admitted her to a locked unit. We said this way the nurses sort of, they literally take all your medications and they lock them up at the nurse's station and they only administer them through the hospital, hospital pharmacy. And so about a week and a half in, this woman's still wildly dyskinetic. You know, she's coming down the hall with her walker and she's twitching and got the wiggles, you know, the dyskinesias, and we're thinking, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense, you know, and we're, after a couple of weeks, we know we're outside that window where you can have that long-term reaction from the levodopa for the dyskinesias, and I don't know how it happened, but maybe the nurse came in to get her for dinner, knocked on her door, opened it, and she's got half of her walker disassembled, and she had had extra levodopa pills <laughs> hidden down in her walker, I'm not kidding you, so very much an addiction-like state where she's, you know, like the heroin addict, she's stashing her supply all up in her walker and everything. And so at that point, we knew, we knew there was something uh, driven with this. And so, again, it's not that common, but when you do see it, it makes for sensational cases. I mean, you know, uh, my colleagues and I, we still talk about them and ways to detect it early because, like I said, usually it's not just that they're taking more dopamine, it's that they have all these other behavioral disturbances along with it. Even panic attacks, uh, sometimes in the, they get so sort of elevated with the extra dopamine, they're, they're having big league panic attacks. We had one gentleman who thought his uh, throat was closing off during these episodes, and so his wife was a nurse, and so she made him, her carry a trach kit everywhere they went. So they were driving from their hospital up in Pennsylvania down to ours because it was a bigger center to see if they could figure this out. And they pulled over twice because he thought she might have to trach him because his airway was closing off. But really what it was is he was just panicking. He was completely fine. So again, these uh, just to make a point that when people have a, a problem like this, they're doing things that don't make sense and it, and it can have pretty significant consequences. So. This, it's, it's not clear that this is necessarily related, but I want to mention it while we're on this topic. It's something called punding, and it's, um, it's actually from a Swedish slang term, uh, pundar, which uh, is Swedish, I guess, for blockhead. And where this was first described was in uh, amphetamine addicts. So they'd get intoxicated on amphetamine and they'd take things apart or fiddle with things you know, repeatedly until they weren't high anymore. And they started noticing that a similar thing happened in people with Parkinson's disease. And again, oftentimes when they were in an ele elevated dopamine state, repetitive, purposeless or semi-purposeful behaviors uh, where they're, they're sort of intensely preoccupied fiddling with something. I had one woman who would take everything from this side of the kitchen and move it to that side of the kitchen, and then again. And her husband would come home and say, well, what did you do all day? And she says, well, I rearranged the kitchen <laughs> all day, back and forth. And so this was, it was semi-purposeful. I mean, I'm sure there's times when she rearranged the kitchen and it was useful, you know, but she would do it, you know, six times in a week. And uh, when it's even more involved, we call it hobbyism. So I had a mathematician who like, spent his career publishing high-impact papers on these sophisticated mathematical equations. And then you know, his wife's pretty smart, and she said, look, I've known him for 30 years. And yes, he's brilliant, but something's different about what he's doing now. It's almost like he's caught in a loop. And so he would start the same way with the mathematical equations and just keep going, going, going and we think that was probably a type of punding. So I, I, the reason I wanna give you examples is because when you see something that doesn't make sense, don't dismiss it, or especially if it's, you know, I'm three hours late because they're still doing something and I don't see any end to it, 
just let your doctors know. And I think you'd be surprised. Sometimes there is a connection with the Parkinson's or the medications, and that's all we want to do is have a conversation. And hopefully most of the time we'll be able to reassure you, but occasionally we might be able to say, ah, okay, yeah, we've seen this, and I'm going to show you how to stop it. So um, I'm going to stop there and then talk about executive dysfunction, but impulse control disorders. This, you, how do you treat an impulse control disorder? So once you have that pathological gambling, that hypersexuality, uh, the compulsive buying, the first thing you need to do is stop that dopamine agonist medication, okay? And when we stop that dopamine agonist medication, and this isn't well studied, so this is mostly anecdotal, but here's what we typically see at our center, is when we stop the dopamine agonist, we see the hypersexual behaviors and the binge eating those often go away. And if you think about it, those have a sort of primary reward that's physiologic. So the payoff from sex and the payoff from eating are rewarded sort of intrinsically internally, right? The payoff from gambling and buying is a little more complicated behaviorally. You know, there's a, there's a behavioral reinforcement that happens once you've gambled. You start chasing your losses. You get the glitzy lights and the payoff when the machine spills the coins. And it starts to get reinforced in a way outside of your physiology. And we found those aren't as simple is stopping the agonist. So most of the time, hypersexual behaviors, binge eating, stop the dopamine agonist. A couple of weeks, people go about their normal business. Gambling, we often have to make referral to 12-step groups, you know, Gamblers Anonymous and, and do other things. Same thing with buying and shopping. Uh, they're sort of, they're rewarded by the payoff of getting this new item. And so oftentimes we have to maybe close accounts or restrict access to credit cards in order to stop those. But I just wanted to throw that out there because these things can spin wildly out of control and we've seen a lot of marriages and relationships damaged by these behaviors. And let me tell you, when it happens this way, because, and it happens in at least maybe one out of five people with Parkinson's who take these dopamine agonist medications, it's not really their fault. This is something that they, you know, their doctor gave them this medication, they took it the way they were supposed to, and their behavior changed. And so this is the one thing we also wanna be able to help people with is please don't blame the person who is doing what they were supposed to and then had this happen to them. And so this is another conversation that hopefully can repair things. Um, and then I want to talk about something that's a little, a little more abstract. So we talk about cognitive function and cognitive domains and mental life in general, right? So if you were to say how many cognitive domains there were, I could ask Dr. Mills and he might say seven. I could ask somebody else and they might say nine and other people say, well, that's too many. There's five. Domains of cognition, so things like attention visual perception, memory, just different ways you use your brain to interface with the world, okay? That's what we mean by no means. By and large, Parkinson's disease is considered a, a, a sort of executive domain disease. In fact, most people experience some degree of executive dysfunction with Parkinson's. So then the next question is, what's executive function? Well, if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 definitions, but in general, Executive function is everything a CEO would do, right? Organizing, sequencing, something we call set shifting. So your ability to, let's say you have to wake up in the morning and make breakfast and then you have to wash the dishes, right? You switch from breakfast to the dishes and then, oh, by the way, I've got to get dressed for work and then I've got to go into work and I've got a meeting and then I do the finances and you switch from one thing to the other. That ability to switch from one activity to another efficiently is part of what executive functioning is. And so one of the things that people with Parkinson's often notice early on is, where did my time go? And, they, and they, the first thing they want to blame is the bradykinesia. They say, well, I know I'm moving slower and I'm a little more fatigued, so it must be that. It's more than that. In part, it's this executive dysfunction. It's that time inflation in transitioning from one activity to another. That same executive dysfunction also makes medication management more difficult because remember, you can't organize things, okay? And you're thinking, well, I, you know, four times a day is pretty complicated, but why can't I get it right? And so I want, to give, I, I want to give you an example that hopefully will make this stick. There's also um, 
you know what the central processor is on a computer, how fast your computer can solve problems. In Parkinson's, that CPU, that central processing unit, slows down a little too. So you can still get the right answer. It just might take you a little longer. So when you combine that slowed processing and executive dysfunction, you can see how you get fewer and fewer things done with your day. But what I'm gonna tell you, hopefully, will give you at least one strategy to maximize your ability to do things and complete projects throughout a day. So we call it the Let's Have Tea study. It was done at the University of Rochester. And, and basically it looked at how attentional demands during everyday functioning, you know, simple things, contribute to the way you perform with Parkinson's disease compared to people who don't have Parkinson's. And so they took 20 people with mild to moderate Parkinson's disease compared to 10 people who didn't have Parkinson's disease. And they asked them to do four different tasks. The first task was walk from a mock kitchen to a mock living room, and they timed you. And then the second was what's called dual motor. So they wanted you to walk and carry a tray, okay? And in this particular one, they had like a tea set on it, like you were gonna walk from the kitchen to serve tea to your guests in the living room. And they timed you. And then they had dual cognitive. So now you're walking, which is a motor task, and you're recalling a list of words from memory, okay? So that's called dual, it's called, you know, cognitive is the recalling and walking is the motor, and then multiple motor cognitive. So now you're walking, carrying a tray, and recalling a list of words from memory. And what did we find? Everybody, people with Parkinson's, people without Parkinson's, everybody slowed down with increasing task complexity, whether it was the cognitive task or the motor task. But what was really striking is that the people with Parkinson's disease slowed down much more than the people without because they already had the executive dysfunction. So every time they had to add another element or multitask, they did even worse. So none of us are good multitaskers. No one, with or without Parkinson's, we're all terrible multitaskers. People with Parkinson's are especially bad. So the message from this study is, if you want to perform at your best with Parkinson's, you need to eliminate distractions, do one thing at a time, and then move on to the next thing, okay? Don't try to do three things at once. Don't try to field a telephone call or, you know, you know, doing your taxes or anything like that because none of us are very good at it. And once you have the Parkinson's, you're particularly not good at it. And so I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh, see if there's any questions. Or wait, we're saving questions or are we taking questions? Take I'll take questions. Any questions? So that's a great question. So let me repeat it here, because I, I hear there are some people, maybe remotely, who are, or am I just making that up? Somebody's listening, the Russians are listening. So the question was, um, should you take your psychiatric medications with your Parkinson's medications? Are there any interactions? And by and large, most of the things that I showed on that list, like the venlafaxine, are, are perfectly fine to take with your Parkinson's medications. In fact, the guidance I usually give is don't, you're already taking medications four or five, six times a day. Don't create a new dosing interval to accommodate these. Just pair them with something else. If your morning meds are fine, most of these medications you want to take, uh, you know, once you've had a meal or something on your stomach. So I know dopamine, sometimes you want to avoid protein or whatnot. These, it's better if you have a little something on your stomach, but they're perfectly fine to take with any of the Parkinson's medications. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Hey, Doc. Mm -hmm. If you see something, say something. The ad on TV, um, you've seen a thing or two. Absolutely, yeah. That's, um, I, I guess uh, what he just said, most of the time with these impulse control disorders, it's not the person who's doing them who comes to us, it's a family member who's worried because it's out, out of the box, let's say. Good point. Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, there's two types of uh, patches that might help with anxiety. The one that I just tested in my study was called uh, retigotine or the new pro patch. And again, it's, you know, the data isn't out yet, uh, so we can't say with confidence that it's going to help. We can say that it was tolerated well. Um, the other one that might help, and again, it, it's uh, investigational, is sometimes there's some secondary evidence that the um, Exelon patch or Rivastigmine patch might help a little bit, but again, it may be that it's in populations that already have some cognitive impairment. One more. Yeah, um, the, this one you probably don't want to be in, but uh, it's for people who have uh, hallucinations, and it's an a investigational drug that is marketed at higher doses, levetiracetam. And so the reason I, I joke and say you might not want to be in it is because you have to have a significant problem with hallucinations in order to come into the study, but certainly as soon as we uh, get it up and running and through the IRB, we'll get some flyers out to all of you. And this is any type, uh, right now we're most interested in people who have visual disturbances, and we'll be using a drug called levetiracetam that's marketed for epilepsy in doses that are much higher than what we're using. Uh, and it'll probably be a, a six-week study. Thanks, Greg.